hard working, pariah, wine lover, Hall and Oates fan. Murderer. What do these words have in common? <laughs> yeah. Struggling to find the connection? All of these words were written down by members of a focus group when asked to describe trans people. Some of these words are not like the others. One of the people running this focus group was author Aubrey Gordon. She noticed the difference in these words too. When prompted, it turns out that one man, the one who wrote the words hardworking, Hall and Oates fan, wine lover, he was the only person in the focus group who actually knew a trans person, a coworker of his. His descriptors were qualitatively different from those of the other participants. Likely because when he heard the word trans, he thought of a real person. A real person with a unique personality, interests, likes, and dislikes. Research supports this anecdote. Personally knowing a trans individual nearly doubles the rate of sympathy for the trans community as a whole, as compared with not knowing. And this sort of sympathy, or the lack thereof, makes a critical difference, especially in today's climate. The introduction of anti-LGBTQ legislation has skyrocketed in the last three to four years with anti-trans legislation increasing the most dramatically. 604 anti-trans bills were introduced nationally in 2023, 86 of which passed, and 393 have been introduced so far this year, 2024, 42 of which have passed. I can't say for sure that the people introducing and backing these bills don't know someone who's trans, but I'd be willing to guess that many of them do not. I'd be willing to guess that many of them have never sat down to dinner or worked alongside or had more than a two minute conversation with one of the trans and gender nonconforming people that these bills target. Personal relationships make a difference. Personal relationships make a difference in how we see the world and in how we see and understand ourselves. Personal relationships in which we relate to people as they actually are, not as we think they should be. This is what philosopher Martin Buber calls the I-thou relationship, one which is based on acceptance and interconnectedness. Buber sets this in contrast to the I-it relationship, in which others are viewed as objects. An I thou relationship in which someone is seen as a dedicated co-worker with a love for early 80s rock an i it relationship in which someone is seen as an outcast 
or even a dangerous, violent threat before they even share their name. Jesus makes some rather shocking statements about relationships in today's scripture. If you were here last week, you'll remember that at this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been stirring up some trouble. He is in conflict with certain religious leaders. So far, he's challenged their understanding of power, authority, and ritual. And this challenge is so destabilizing that some begin to think that Jesus is mentally unwell. We're told that his own biological family is operating out of concern for his mental health, or at least the social pressure around concern for his mental health. They go so far as to try and restrain him. Others believe that Jesus is possessed, calling on demonic powers for his miracles and healings. In today's scripture, it's clear that the religious authorities don't get it. And that Jesus' own family doesn't get it. In other words, the people one might most expect would understand Jesus, other religious teachers, his own flesh and blood, do not. The crowd does. Or at least they see and they understand enough to follow. And who is in that crowd? Lepers and demoniacs, women and children, the diseased and their friends, sinners and tax collectors. These are the ones who get Jesus. These are the ones who seek an I-thou relationship with Jesus. And these are the ones whom Jesus calls family. It's a shocking pronouncement. Family ties were the bedrock of society at that time. Jesus is sitting with the crowd when his mother and brothers arrive. They send for him. And instead of immediately responding, as would have been expected, Jesus looks to the faces around him and says, Who are my mother and my brothers? Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is hard for someone like me to understand. I have a really great relationship with my biological family. I'm lucky enough to both love them and like them. I can't imagine my mother arriving at my condo as she's going to do in just a few days and my response being anything other than to buzz her in. I also suspect I would be in a little bit of trouble if my response was anything other than to buzz her in. Just yesterday I was texting with her and she was telling me how her and my dad are going to stop in Chilton County, Alabama, on their drive up here, which has the best peaches in the United States, to buy a whole like pallet to bring me because they know me and love me and want good things for me. 
They know I love peaches. That's the kind of relationship I have with my family. And so this is hard for me to understand. Jesus' words are as disturbing for many of us today as they were at the time. His words can confuse those of us who have healthy connections with our family of origin. But his words are perfectly understandable to those who do not feel seen by their families. To those who have experienced deep conflict with a biological relative, who have been harmed or abused by kin, or who have had their essential identity denied by family members. I imagine that Jesus' words are perfectly understandable to many within the LGBTQ community who have formed chosen family in place of, or sometimes in addition to, biological family formed chosen families often out of necessity because their flesh and blood family refuses to see them fully as a thou. This term, chosen family, it refers to kinship bonds that are created outside of one's family of origin. A chosen family is something deeper than even close friendship. It's a commitment to doing life together. The concept of chosen family has its roots in the queer community, but extends beyond it. I'm sure that many of us have people in our lives who we relate to in this way. People who love us with all our faults and foibles who drive us to the doctor and help raise our children, people with whom we celebrate the holidays and visit on sick beds. It's always been curious to me that Christian family values are culturally defined in such a limited way epitomized by a heterosexual, cisgendered white couple with two and a half children. Because that's simply not how Jesus defines family. It's just not. Instead, Jesus draws the circle of family far wider than many of us find comfortable. Jesus says that family is determined not solely by biology or marriage, but by values. His family is any who does the will of God. His family are the members of the crowd, which undoubtedly included people from a variety of religious traditions, ethnicities, genders, ages, abilities, and social positions. Now, this is not a wholesale rejection of biological family. We know from other scriptures that Jesus does care for his family of origin. Indeed, one of his final actions on the cross is to provide for his mother, entrusting her to his beloved disciple. Yet Jesus still challenges the idea that family is exclusive to biology. His kinship extends to all who value and share in the love ethic. As it says in 1 John, let us love one another. Because love is from God. Everyone who loves God is born of God and knows God. For God is love. This definition of family provides both comfort and challenge. It is a comfort for those on the margins who too often are treated as it or as other. It is a comfort for any of us who can easily picture ourselves in the crowd. 
a crowd that today would certainly still include lepers and demoniacs, the sinners and the sick, the very young and the very old, but would also include today's marginalized, trans and gender nonconforming folks, addicts and alcoholics, migrants, the disabled, the incarcerated, the homeless. This reformation of family is a challenge for those who align with the conventions of domestic, religious, or political authority, those who, like me, fit pretty neatly into mainstream categories. It challenges us to form I-thou relationships with those whom society disregards and to listen to the voices of those in the crowd. In this way, we're lucky to live in these times because we have access to this in unprecedented ways. In addition to forming in-person relationships, we have access to books and documentaries, podcasts, TV shows that help tell the stories of the margins. Stories like the one I told at the beginning of this sermon, stories that transform someone in our minds from a category to a human being. Stories that help us get to know and value all of our siblings. If you're not sure where to begin, that's a pretty good place to start. With stories. Of course, all of this is easier said than done, right? We like to think that it's simple to do the right thing. We like to think that the good moral choice is as obvious as one of those what would Jesus do bracelets. Do you remember those? But the truth of the matter is that all of us struggle. We all struggle with unconscious biases and habituated ways of being that calcify our hearts. It's not easy to change. As theologian Howard Thurman put it in the first reading for today, our hearts are the center for not only our loves and our hungers, but also for our fears and our hates. Our hearts harbor a yearning to connect right alongside deep suspicion of those who are not like us. So what can we do but pray? Pray for the courage to be more like Jesus. Pray for the fortitude to treat others as we would like to be treated as a thou, as a full human. What can we do but pray to be more holy in our hearts? and trust that the Jesus who comforts us and challenges us provides a grace that will suffice. Amen.